very good evening friends we, we very cordially welcome to this answer key session from shivarajula is academy so i'm going to discuss the questions from science and technology and environment and in fact this year we had quite a chunk of questions uh, from this area about 33 you know we can say one third of the uh, prelims question paper from this year came from this two area uh, UPSC is really becoming very unpredictable but yes analysis of question paper we can do it uh, later but now our first priority and our first importance is getting the right answer so we'll take it up the first question question number 21 um, okay question number 21 water can dissolve more substances than any other liquid yes this is a very true fact that is the reason why water is usually called as universal solvent the when we say the water h2o it is actually a very unique structure uh, I, I think it's better not to go too much into the details of the chemical structure of water but the point is this a water molecule when we take one part of it will have a partial negative character and the other part of it will have a partial positive character so one molecule on one side is negative the other side is positive that is poles you know like north pole south pole so this polar nature dipolar negative on one side and positive on other side makes it uniquely interact with many chemical molecules because it interacts it dissolves so water can dissolve more substances than any other liquid because it is dipolar in nature but one trick in this question is they have given all the three statements the, all the three statements are correct it is not wrong it's correct but for this question the correct answer is a it is dipolar in nature then with the reference to street lighting how do sodium lamps differ from LD, led lamps so they are asking a particular reference to street lighting street lighting traditionally have used sodium vapor lamps the sodium vapor lamps which operates to about the 2600 kelvins compared to led lamps which operates to about 1900 kelvin temperature but the point is if you look at that the first statement the first statement says sodium lamps produce light in 360 degrees but it is not so in case of led lamps now this is quite tricky in the exam pressure if you read this statement you would have thought for sodium lamp degrees means you would have thought of temperature but this is not talking about temperature this is the angle of projection of light it is not about temperature please understand so sodium lamp produce light in 360 degrees but it is not so it does it's not true in fact both sodium lamp as well as led lamp are known for producing light in 360 degrees it is not like a laser in only one direction like this lighting in this room it is projected in all the directions so first statement is wrong because it says it is not so in the case of led lamp now if you keep this in mind oh first statement is wrong then if you see the options c and d can be easily eliminated okay so we have to find whether third is correct or second is correct And second statement it says as street light sodium lamps have longer lifespan than led lamps it doesn't matter whether we use it in streets or whether we use it in uh, uh, domestic lighting led lamps are always known to be superior in lighting okay so second statement has to be correct because led is known to have a longer shelf life even though sodium vapor lamps are equally good led lamps are best in terms of the shelf life so second statement has to be right so you don't have to worry about the third statement because you would have heard about LED lamps in many government schemes like Ujala already. So here we have to see that second statement is a right statement because one is wrong. So for the question number 22, the correct answer is two only. Okay. Now let's move to the next question number 23. The term S2 
the term S2 is talked about in the context of what? Probably you would have heard about, you would have heard about S2 many times in the newspapers because S2 is associated with the SARS corona infection, right? SARS CO2 infection, it enters the human cells through this receptor called as ACE2 receptors, which is widely distributed in many cells of our body. It is through this ACE2 receptors, angiotensin converting enzyme 2, which plays a very important role in maintenance of blood pressure and pain mechanisms. It is through this ACE2 receptors, the SARS coronavirus 2, COVID virus 2 is known to enter the human systems. So what could be the correct answer? It is not genes introduced in genetically modified plants. It has nothing to do with the plants wrong. It is not about navigation system. And the correct answer is spread of viral diseases because that is what S2 is associated with. So 23rd question, the answer is D. It has to be easy question, more like a straightforward. Okay. Now, the next question. Question number 24, bisphenol A. Question number 24, bisphenol A. A cause of concern, yes. Bisphenol A is a greater cause of concern because it is a carcinogenic agent. It is also known to mimic hormones. It is called as endocrine disrupting chemicals, EDC. Which one? Bisphenol is called as endocrine disrupting chemicals. Of course, it is a cause of concern. But this cause of concern, they are asking the question, it is a structural key component, correct? In the manufacture of which of the following kinds of plastics? Now, this is where the trick might come. Bisphenol A. Um, um, in fact, in the recent times, there, there has been a lot of news about bisphenol A and PCB, polychlorinated um, biphenyls. But fortunately, we had a question on bisphenol A. So this bisphenol A, in fact, is involved in the manufacturing of two kinds of polymers. One polycarbonate and second epoxy resins. Epoxy resins, which is usually used as a coating. Uh, if you buy any uh, beverage drinks or any uh, packaged food items, you can see shiny coat on the inner side of the can, right? The shiny coat on the inner side of the food can is actually nothing but bisphenol A coating. And also polycarbonates, the common water bottles that we use, they are all made using bisphenol A. So the correct answer for this question is B. It might be a very direct question. So probably uh, you cannot guess uh, anything here. It's, it's like either you know it or you don't know it. So 24th question, the correct answer is polycarbonate. Now the next one, question number 25. Question number 25. Triclosan considered harmful when exposed to high levels for a long time is most likely present in which of the following? Triclosan. One of the um, problem that you might have had in guessing this triclosan is sometimes the word triclosan is associated with toothbrush. So you would have thought something like a preservatives. Probably that's where you might have guessed to wrong. Okay, so triclosan actually is used mainly in hand wash, cosmetic items, toiletries. Now, now can we see how um, the corona-related uh, uh, best practices like uh, ma maintaining personal hygiene, maintaining social distance is indirectly asked in questions. This is in fact a question pertaining to the personal hygiene means um, oh, uh, constantly wiping our uh, hands with alcohol and also washing our hands. Because we wash our hands, triclosan comes into the picture. So triclosan, in fact, is an antibacterial compound. It is an antibacterial compound which has the greatest effect on killing bacteria. So that is why we use it in hand washes. Triclosan, the answer is toiletries. Then question number 26, which one of the following is a reason why astronomical distances are measured in light years? This 
is an easy question if you pay attention and focus on it. Otherwise, it will be tricky. So, why astronomical distances are measured in light years? Let us approach the question. Distances among stellar bodies do not change. But we already know that expansion of the universe happens. So when the expansion of the universe happens, distance can't remain same. So first statement is wrong. Second, gravity of stellar bodies does not change. Gravity of stellar bodies does not change is kind of a correct statement. But is it actually relevant to that? Because gravity doesn't change, in what way it is going to affect light year as a measurement tool? It's not going to help in any way. Second, light always travels in straight line. We all, we, we, you would have heard about what is called the Einstein ring. It actually been featured in the news recent times. Einstein ring, where there is a bending of light in the presence of a strong uh, gravitational body like a black hole. Black hole with its gravitational field can even bend the light. So now can we say that it travels in straight line? So the statement is wrong. Particularly, they use the word always. If you say light travels in straight line, that's correct statement. But when they say always straight, it becomes wrong. And not only that, it has no connection with the reason why astronomers use it. The next is speed of life, light is always constant. Usually when we say, what is the astronomical year? 9.46 into 1012 kilometer. This is what called as one light year. And this has to be same every time. You cannot change the speed, okay? So light is something very reliable because it does not change speed. Because it has a constant speed, we use it to measure the long distances, the distances between the stars. So speed of light is always the same. It's a very logical question, right? You don't have to know a deeper scientific understanding of it. Yeah, only when the speed is constant, we can use it as a measurement, right? So the correct answer, D. For question number 26, the correct answer is D. Question number 33. Let's move on to question number 33. Now, this is about Moringa. In Tamil, it is called as Murunga Imaram, Moringa, Moringa Olifera, and Tamarind. You know what UPC has done, which they are very expert in doing. They interchange the qualities of both. Moringa, actually, in our daily experience, where you, are, you would have watched this Moringa tree at the back of your home, you would have known that in the summertime, it sheds the leaves. It cannot be green all the years. But if you've seen uh, tamarind tree, it is always green throughout the year. In fact, it is a tamarind tree which is evergreen, but Moringa is a deciduous tree. But what they did, they actually changed it. Moringa actually is not leguminous. It is not a leguminous evergreen tree. It is wrong. Actually, it is a tamarind which is a leguminous evergreen tree. Okay, so first statement is wrong. If the first statement is wrong, let's see, can we eliminate? You see, if you eliminate the first statement, then obviously this is eliminated, this is eliminated, this is also eliminated, and the correct answer is 3, 4, and 5. It's a very, very, very simple. But if you see the rest of the questions, fine. If you see the rest of the question, the first one is wrong, obviously. The second, tamarind tree is endemic to South Asia. Correct. In India, most of the tamarind is collected as minor forest produce. Correct. I'm sorry. Two is also wrong. I'm sorry. Three, four, five is the correct answer. Because tamarind is not endemic to South Asia. It is endemic to North Africa. So second statement is wrong. Three, in India, most of the tamarind is collected as minor forest produce. It came in the news recently because Ministry of Tribal Affairs has increased um, the number of minor forest produce from 50 to 73, 23 more products were added because people need to earn more during this tough COVID times. So as increasing the livelihood opportunities, Minister of Tribal, Tribal Affairs recently increased. Okay, in that news, um, tamarind also came in the picture, tamarind fruit as well as seeds. Then India exports tamarind and moringa, yes. 
In fact, 80% of exports of Moringa and 50% of exports of tamarind is from India. So India is a dominant player in these two plants. The fifth one, so it is correct, four is correct, five is also correct. Seeds of Moringa and tamarind, yes, seeds of Moringa and tamarind are rich in oleic acids. It's called as oleic acids. And the clue is this, guys. In fact, any uh, oil-rich compound, any oil-rich substance can be used for the making of biodiesel. It doesn't mean that it always has to be a particular source. Any oil, including used oil, can be used, can be uh, equipped for the production of biodiesel. So here, seeds of moringa and the seeds of tamarind can be used in the production of biofuel. Yes, it is correct. So the answer is three, four, and five. But we don't have to go through all this stuff, uh, uh, all these deductions. Once you know the one is wrong, then obviously you already got the right answer. Then question number 35. With reference to recent development regarding recombinant vector vaccines. See, whenever we talk about vector vaccines, recombinant vector vaccines, it's very simple. They will use what is called as a virus or a bacteria or even yeast to carry the gene for vaccine. See, vaccine cannot be given to us directly. The vaccine should be given to each and every one of our cells, right? Who can infect the cells? Yeast can do that. Bacteria can do that. Fun uh, virus can do that. So these kind of transporter molecules, they are like a transporter. They transport the gene for vaccine. They are called as vectors. They are actually called as vectors. So recombinant means two different genes are unnaturally combined. This unnatural combination of more than one gene is called as recombinant. So recombinant vector vaccines. Now, with this understanding, let's see the question. Genetic engineering is applied in the development of this vaccine. Yes, because it is recombinant. Recombinant vaccine is not possible without taking one gene, taking another, another gene and putting them together, splicing them together. So, genetic engineering is involved. Correct. Bacteria and viruses are used as vectors. That's also correct statement. So for 35th question, the correct answer is both 1 and 2. In the context of, in the context of hereditary diseases, consider the following statements. Probably UPC has been obsessed with uh, mitochondrial diseases. It, this has been the second time they asked the question. Before two years, they asked the same similar kind of a question from mitochondrial diseases, mitochondrial replacement therapy, they are asking the same question again. So it is relevant to mitochondrial genetic disorders. It's a very uh, technical description which is required to explain the concept. The point is very simple. If a woman mitochondria is genetically defective, then all her child will be affected. But if the father is having defective mitochondria, no problem, it won't be inherited. It won't be passed to the next generation. Only the defective mitochondria from the mother is the problem. So how can we solve it? So the defective mitochondria from the mother is a problem. So what they do, they find another woman who is having a healthy mitochondria called as donor. And with that woman, they will take the father's sperm and fertilize it. Okay. Then after fertilization or before fertilization, they will take only the nucleus of the mother. Because nucleus is you know. How can I say this is my child? Only when my nucleus goes. So they will take the nucleus and replace it. The first question asks whether this can be done before fertilization or after fertilization. In fact, there are two common methods used in them. Mitochondrial replacement therapy, which is just said just now. One is called as pro-nuclear transfer, PNT. Now, this pro-nuclear transfer is done after fertilization. There's another method called as mitotic spindle transfer. Mitotic spindle transfer, this can be done before the fertilization. 
So this mitochondrial replacement therapy can be done both before or after the fertilization of the egg. So with that way, first statement is correct. Second, a child inherits mitochondrial disease entirely from mother, not from father. Yes, it's a very correct statement. So both the statements are correct. The answer is C. Question number 36, the answer is C. Then 37th question, ball guard 1 and ball guard 2. Actually, when we say the word ball, actually, it is actually a reference to a pest called as ball worm. Guard means G-A-R-D, actually it stands for G-U-A-R-D. Now, you, you, you came across anywhere where ball worm affects which crop? Cotton. Cotton is the most affected crop because of ball worm. So that ball worm which affects the cotton is guarded, protected. So ball guard 1 and ball guard 2 is nothing but technology relevant to BT cotton, which was first introduced in 2002. Ball guard 1 was introduced in 2002, called as single gene technology. And ball guard 2 was launched in 2006, called as double gene technology. So now let's see. What it should be related to? It is related to developing genetically modified crop plants. So the correct answer for 37th question is B. Thirty-eighth question. In a pressure cooker, the temperature at which the cook is food is cooked depends mainly upon which of the following. Now, this is most trickiest. If you guys ask me, there are two, three questions which seems to be very tricky. That one of the tricky questions is this. So, the question they are asking, in a pressure cooker, okay, the temperature depends. Let's, let's forget this. this. Let's forget this area. Let's wipe it up. Let's say, in a pressure cooker, the temperature depends mainly upon which of the following. The more simplify the, uh, sim you attempt to simplify the question, the easier to interpret it, it becomes. So the temperature depends mainly upon which of the following. <clears throat> now, area of the hole in the lid. You would have seen pressure cookers where there is a small hole. Now that hole is actually a safety mechanism that when the pressure builds up too much, it acts as an yeah, instant vent for the pressure to release. It is a safety mechanism. It is nothing to do with controlling the temperature. Probably this pressure cooker, this temperature, this kind of things, they have asked questions about seven, eight years back. Uh, for some weird reasons, UPSC is going back the track. They are going back the track. They are trying to retracing their paths, asking the questions back again. But let's see. So what could be the factor determining the temperature inside the pressure cooker? Pressure. Pressure cooker depends upon the pressure for the temperature. So what increases the pressure increases the temperature as simple as that. So one weight of the lid, you would have seen the weight of the lid. For example, in a pressure cooker, you put a light weight, uh, uh, weight. If the pressure builds even little, the weight will be lifted, the pressure will be released. If the pressure will be released, temperature will decrease. You get it? So three should be the first priority for you to choose. So then this can be eliminated. Then everything else comes. Okay, the elimination can't be done much. Then temperature of the flame. Naturally, the temperature of the flame increases the boiling of the water. If the boiling wa of the water increases, it increases pressure. And the pressure increases, temperature also increases. So two is correct. So 2 and 3 is correct. So it has to be either this or it has to be either this. But looking at the first question, the area of the hole in the lid, it is only for safety purposes that there is a hole. It has nothing to do with temperature maintenance. So first one is not. The correct answer is B, 2 and 3 only. So 38th question, the answer is B. The next question. 39th question, consider the following bacteria, fungi, virus. Which of the above can be cultured? Cultured means not like a human culture. For these kind of organisms, culture means growing. 
in artificial synthetic medium. See, um, this virus is like a foreign dog breed. This foreign dog breed uh, will eat only pedigree, it, it, it will eat only specific food, means live cells. You would have read about virus, right? Virus can live only inside live cells. But uh, our dogs, uh, but other local breeds will say they can eat any food that you discard uh, back at your home. They don't have any preference. Bacteria or fungi is like that. Virus is a very sophisticated uh, guy, we can say dog. So, in fact, virus can live only inside the cells, only inside the cells. It will not grow in artificial medium. It will not grow in synthetic medium. See, you would have read. Virus is intracellular parasite, but rather than asking it directly, they are asking in an indirect way. You know, that's how UPSC wants to trick us. They are asking this in a very indirect way. So, the base point, what is the base point for this? The base point for this is this. It is an intracellular parasite, so it needs live cells to grow. And that is the reason why it cannot grow in any synthetic media. So, except virus, one and two, A is the right answer. So, 39th question, A, 1 and 2 is the right answer. Then, once again, um, I think uh, UPSC has glamorizing virus because COVID has glamorized all of us. So, there is a lot of questions relevant to virus and all. We heard about recombinant vector vaccines. Now, we had this. We also have another question later. So, let us see. Question number 40. Uh, I do know virus. The, uh, in fact, not only for this reason, I do know virus been recent in the news for many reasons. Because I do know virus is a commonly used vector for vaccines. For the recombinant vaccines, I told you vac vector is used to write. Which vector? The most commonly used is I do know virus. The success rate of vaccines that uses I do know virus are extremely large. So, if something is used as a vector, it has to as closely mimic human, right? Because we are using it for human vaccine. Human has how many DNA strand? Double strand or single strand? Imagine. If you use a virus which is single strand and we are double strand, you see the incompatibility? Of course, it is incompatible. If adenovirus is very successful vector for a vaccine, it should be double stranded. Now, I am I'm, I'm using logic. I am not giving the fact. The logic? No. It has to be double stranded. Okay. So, it is single standard makes it wrong. Forget this. But you should not have made the uh, thing that retrovirus have double standard DNA. Retro itself means RNA, right? You would have heard retro always means RNA. So, that mistake you should not have done. So, first statement is wrong. In both adenovirus case and the retrovirus case, it is wrong. Retrovirus have RNA as a genome, not DNA. And second statement, common cold is sometimes caused by an adenovirus, yes. Whereas AIDS is caused by a retrovirus, yes. AIDS caused by HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. It is a retrovirus. So, two only is a correct answer, B. Two only is a correct answer. So, question number 41. So, one of the area which is uh, fast uh, gaining popularity but very hard to understand is permaculture. There is one probability of confusion that can happen because permafrost, a region which is uh, covered under ice for more than two years called as permafrost. Do not confuse that permafrost with the permaculture. Permaculture actually stands for permanent culture. It is an agricultural system. Generally speaking, agriculture have been so far used for making food, only food. But permaculture is most closely aimed to live as close as possible with the natural systems, not as only for food, but close in living in close association with the natural systems that food, energy, timber, and other essential services, eco services are derived from the activities. So, it is not only food, it is everything together. Now, that is what the closest definition I can give you because there is no single definition for permaculture. But we know what is uh, uh, traditional agriculture and what is permaculture. Now, let us compare them both. Permaculture farming discourages monoculture practices. Yes, of course. 
you grow it for food, you grow in large numbers as a monoculture. But you want to live as close in nature, nature does not prefer monoculture. Nature is something where diversity is there. So first statement, it discourages monoculture practices, correct? But in conventional chemical farming, monoculture practices are predominant, correct? First one is a correct statement. Now let us see whether can we uh, get any correct answers. Oh, yes. See? A or B, it has to be either A or it has to be B. Now, what you have to do? 1 and 3, 1, 2, 1, 4. The only task you have, just go and see the third statement. Third statement says, conventional chemical farming is easily possible in semi-arid regions, correct? But permaculture farming is not so easily possible in such regions. Yes, it is also known to be correct. The main problem uh, with that, okay, I'll come to the other statements also. Permaculture is known to be uh, extremely friendly to the environment, to the ecosystem. But one problem is because of the diversity of the plants that is grown, the availability of water is always a problem for such culture. But uh, conventional agriculture can thrive using uh, irrigation methods. But that irrigation methods is not much favored in permaculture because permaculture want to be as natural as possible. So that is the reason why permaculture may not be suitable in arid or semi-arid areas. So third statement is a correct statement, which makes it A, 1 and 3 as a right answer. But when you say mulching, they say, for let's, let's cross check our answer. But 1 and 3 is right answer, but let's cross check it. Fourth statement says, practice of mulching is very important in permaculture farming, but not necessarily so in conventional farming, no. Mulching is practiced even in conventional farming as well as in permaculture. There is no kind of a difference between the both. So correct answer is 1 and 3 for the question 41. The correct answer is 1 and 3. <coughs> okay. Question number 42. With reference to palm oil, consider the following statements. The palm oil tree is native to South Asia, Southeast Asia. Indonesia and Malaysia, which is the largest supplier of palm oil to the world. 80% of the palm oil is from Southeast Asia. True. So it seems like palm oil is native to Southeast Asia, but that's not true. Palm oil, in fact, is native to Africa. It is from Africa. About two centuries back, it was taken to Malaysia, and it is there. It becomes a naturalized species. So palm oil tree is a natural naturalized species, not it is native to Southeast Asia. So one is wrong. Second, the palm oil is a raw material for some industries producing lipstick and perfumes. Yes, it is also a raw material for lipstick because palm is bright red in color. And that can be used for making certain uh, lipstick uh, ingredients also. Third statement. So one is wrong. Two is correct. The palm oil. So two is correct. It has to be D. It has to be A or it has to be B. The palm oil can be used to produce biodiesel. What I told you, there are certain tricks you should have. Biodiesel means any oil rich compound can be used for biodiesel, any oil. So palm oil, why not? In fact, uh, about uh, a year back, the Malaysian government decided for uh, uh, mixing of 5% five, five of palm oil with uh, diesel. Like how we have ethanol blended uh, petrol program, they have palm oil blended diesel program, 5%. So it can be done. It can be used to make biodiesel, correct? So the correct answer is 2 is correct, 3 is correct. The answer is B. Question number 42, B is the right answer. OK. <clears throat> then let's move on to question number 46. Global Ocean Commission grants licenses for seabed exploration and mining in international waters. Ah. What a blunder they had done. This Global Ocean Commission is an obscure international initiative where some one or three institutes have been the members. But actually, who controls the exploration of seabed minerals? International Seabed Authority, right? International Seabed Authority was constituted under UN clause, UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. So first one is wrong. See how simple it is. This basics, you should not have done an error. So the correct answer is 2 and 3, as simple as that. The correct answer is 2 and 3, that's it.
among the following, which one is the least water efficient crop? Least water efficient crop. Um, in fact, it is considered to be the sugar cane. Sugar cane is considered to be the least water efficient crop, which requires about 2000 millimeter per hectare. Per hectare. So, A, the least efficient is that. But at least you should have known uh, to eliminate some answers. For example, you would have known millet. This is a very suitable crop for dry land areas, right? So, millet you should have known that it cannot be that. Millet is one of the water efficient crops. And the same goes for sunflower because sunflower you can see even grown in uh, dry lands, semi arid areas. So, their water requirement is also less. Probably you have to choose only between sugarcane and red gram. Red gram has a water efficiency of about only 600 to 700 millimeter per hectare. But that's not the case with sugarcane, it's 2000. So, correct answer is A. Question number 47, A is the answer. So, climate smart village, once again we are having a climate smart agriculture, climate smart village which was a question asked last year. So, climate smart agriculture, consider the following statements, the climate smart village as a concept, yes it was a concept started in 2011 in Africa and Asia. So, this in this climate smart project started by CGIAR, India is a part of it, correct, first statement is correct. Punjab and Haryana are actually taking part in climate smart villages, which in fact a global initiative started by CGIAR, correct. So, first statement is correct. Then second statement, the project of CCA, CCAFS is carried out under the consultative group on international agricultural research headquartered in France. They are simply asking, don't worry about that, whether CGIAR is uh, headquartered in France. <coughs> One suggestion that would have to, I, I would have said you is, it's a very, very, very specific information. So this kind of question, it's better to avoid it rather than taking risk. But um, uh, I'm giving answer after reference. But if you ask me uh, beforehand, no, I, I even I don't know and the correct answer for that. So, but actually CGIAR, its headquarters is in France, correct. And third statement, the, inst the International Crop Research Institute, famously called a SICRISAT, is in fact one of the research centers for CGIAR? Yes. So all the three statements are correct for this question. The correct answer is D, 1213. Question number 49, D, 1213 is the correct answer. Question number 50, they are asking once again, leaf litter decomposes faster than in any other biome, okay? And as a result, the soil surface is almost bare because decomposition happens. There is not much you can see in the flow, they say. Apart from trees, the vegetation is largely composed of plant forms that reach up into the canopy vicariously by climbing the trees or growing as epiphyte. I want to tell you, this is the clue for you. You cannot find an answer for this question in any other part of this except this. Epiphyte. You must have known that epiphyte, epi means outer, phyte means plant. So, a plant which grows over the surface of another plant, they climb, is called as epiphytes. So, epiphytes, where it can be found? It's a very simple logic, guys. Why epiphytes are growing abundantly there? Because they find a lot of nutrition. But the problem there is they have a lot of nutrition, but they don't get enough sunlight because in this forest, trees are growing so much that light cannot come down. So what they do, they climb these trees, reach the canopy to get the sunlight directly, epiphytes. Now can you tell me where it can fit the dense, dark uh, surf, uh, floor of a forest? Deciduous forest, dry deciduous forest is not as dense so that it does not allow the light to fall. So it has to be seen, you would, you would have guessed. It cannot be coniferous, it cannot be mangrove. At least you should have guessed that. It has to be either dry deciduous or tropical. But dry deciduous forest is not thick enough so that the light cannot penetrate the canopy. And the density So the only option remaining is 
tropical rainforest, which is what epiphytes are known for. Epiphytes are very well known to be found abundantly in tropical rainforest because of the reason I've said earlier. So 50th question, the clue is there. So you need to train yourself <coughs> which part of the question is the absolute key to find the right answer. So 50th question, the answer is D. Seventy-first question, which one of the following is used in preparing a natural mosquito repellent? I want to tell you guys, if you've gone to any organic shop or even nowadays, even in normal shops, you would have getting agarbattis, you're getting mosquito coils, you're getting rep, uh, uh, sprays, lemongrass. Lemongrass actually is a source of what oil? It's called a citronella. Have you heard about this citronella? Citronella oil is known to, is known actively for repelling pests, insect pests, including mosquito. That citronella, in fact, is derived from lemongrass. This is one of the easiest question. If you are an average consumer in Indian market, you must have known that lemongrass is the answer for this question. 71 answer C. Consider the following kinds of organisms. Copy ports, cyanobacteria, diatoms, foraminifera. Yes, I understand. It's very technical. Sir, that they would have asked the question. I can say that we are going back to NCRT, the plus one, plus two. Um, uh, the, the, the taxonomic taxonomic classification of animals, I think they are getting interested there. So let's talk about the strategy later. Let's focus on only the key for the session. <clears throat> Which of the above are primary producers? That is a clue. Primary producers means what? Which is capable of photosynthesis. Isn't it? That which is capable of photosynthesis is called as primary producers. Now, who is capable of primary producers? At least you should have known copy pods. They are actually um, uh, aquatic um, arthropods. Simply speaking, they are animals. See, at least you should have known. Cyanobacteria is known as a producer. You should have known that at least. So where two comes here and here. At least you should have narrowed down. It has to be either one or two or two and three. But one copy pods. The next are diatoms. Now you have to go with the best logic. But the correct answer, if you ask me, diatoms is a photosynthetic algae. Sir, OK, sir. Uh, it is a photosynthetic algae, sir, but why it is called as diatoms? Because it is a only living organism. Manna pon, it's a Tamil word, Tamil slang. We used to say, manna pon wanga. You become like a sand man. You know, just go and become a dust. Literally speaking, these diatoms become like that. Because it is a only living organism that contains silica in its cell walls. It is a only living organism. So it is a photosynthetic algae but its uniqueness is having silica in the cell walls. So Adanala, we call it as diatoms, a unique name given for an algae. The correct answer, in fact, is copy pod is an animal. Foraminifera is a single-celled animal. It's also an animal. <clears throat> the correct answer is 2, 1, 3. So B, 2, 1, 3 is the answer for this question. I know <clears throat> these kind of questions, you can make a logical guess. But if you know how to approach it, cyanobacteria is a clue for this question. Question number 73, consider the following animals, hedgehog, marmot, pangolin. To reduce the chance of being captured by predators, which of the above organisms roll up, rolls up and protect, protects, it's there, vulnerable parts. See, UPC wants to be grammatically correct. Correct. <laughs> so I, 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 we have to appreciate the due care uh, they are given to minute details. Nice. So. Hedgehog, marmot, pangolin, which rolls up. Probably uh, you would have seen what is called as pangolin, at least some pictures of pangolin. Because pangolin is uh, certified <laughs> in a very wrong way as the most trafficked mammal in the world. <clears throat> the most trafficked mammal in the world is pangolin. By WWF, it was certified. The uniqueness about this animal is it is called a scaly anteater. Pangolin is also called a scaly anteater. And it has a very sharp spine tail. If somebody approaches the pangolin, it curls itself like a ball. Because it's scale, animals can't 
put their teeth and reach the muscles. It's hard to bite. And they will also whip it. Like uh, MGR in old movies, you know, it also whips its tail. So pangolin is an animal that can do that. Hedgehog. Uh, hedgehog is also an animal with uh, spines. Probably the name of this animal in local language is called as mullam pandri. So even this hedgehog is uh, threatened by a predator, it rolls up. It has only uh, the spines projecting outwards. It cannot be bitten. So marmot, sir, what about marmot, sir? Yeah, that's where the whole clue is. If marmot tries to roll, sir, I want to tell you that it becomes an easy target. It's like a platter uh, given ready-made. Marmot is nothing but a type of giant squirrel. Squirrel, if it rolls down, you know what will happen? It becomes easy and gulp it down in a one bite. <laughs> so marmot can't do that. It's only for hedgehog and pangolin. The answer is one and three. At least you should have guessed pangolin from the given options. Then it has to be three or C. It has to be C or D. You, you should have made at least a guess in this way. Okay. New York Declaration of Forests, yes, which was in fact signed up in the year 2014 Climate Summit. It's a correct answer. It endorses a global timeline to end the loss of forests. Yes, they want to uh, uh, reduce the forest loss by half, 50% by 2020, and to completely stop the forest loss by 2030. So they have some kind of a goal in terms of cutting down the forest loss, correct. So this is also correct. This is also correct. But at least you should have known New York Declaration on Forests, you should have at least guessed one thing that it is not legally binding. At least you should have known that. Now see, if you guessed, oh, it's not legally binding, then wherever three comes, you just reject it. Wrong, wrong. You are left with only one, two, and four, and two, and five. Now, one, two, we already discussed, it's a correct statement. Now, you're going to see only four or five. Just see four or five. It is endorsed by governments, big companies, and indigenous communities, OK? India was one of the signatories at its inception. Now, look at the logic. Of course, New York Declaration of Forests, there must be contributions, there must be promises made true. Either this has to be correct or this has to be correct. You see the generality of the statement. It is endorsed by governments, big companies, indigenous communities. It has to be a general statement. But look at this. India was one of the signatories at its inception. It's a very specific question. If you ask me, I will say this will be the correct statement. And that is true. And in fact, as of now, India is not a part of New York Declaration on Forest. India is not. If India is not a member of this New York Declaration on Forest now, it would not have been a member at the time of its inception in 2014. So this is a wrong statement. So the correct answer is A, 1, 2, and 4. As I told you, one, another tough question. The one tough question, pressure, cook, pressure cooker and the temperature rises depends on which of the factors I told you. Another tough factor is, tough question is this. Uh, frankly speaking, I couldn't uh, pinpoint what could be the correct answer. I can give you two uh, answers for this, okay? Because magnetite particles are nothing but, <coughs> what is magnetite? Magnetite is nothing but iron oxide. So if you have a chair here, which is rusted, and the air blows, that is also a source of magnetite. So it's very wide sources and associated with many reasons. So I cannot really find out what really could be the source of magnetite particles. But one thing is very sure, either it has to be D found in all or it has to be devoid of telephone lines. It has to be, I'm sorry, devoid of this. It has to be either one, either 1, 2, and 4 or it has to be 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. I'm not very sure because this has been one of the very obscure question that has been asked. Okay, so 75th question, the answer is either B or D. Um, if you ask my intuitive uh, way, I'll go with D, intuitively, not in terms of explanation that I can give, but intuitively I feel D will be the right answer.
76th question, which of the following is a filter feeder? Filter feeder in the water, they don't hunt. With their mouth, with their, with their mouth, they filter the water and whatever is filtered is gulped down. Catfish. Catfish, in fact, is a alien species in Indian waters, particularly now grown in so much in Kerala. So catfish, it hunts other fishes. It cannot be a filter feeder. Octopus, you also would have heard about octopus hunting crabs and other fishes. It also cannot be filter feeder. Pelican, in fact, is nothing but a bird. So by simple elimination, you actually comes to oyster. Oyster is nothing but a bivalve. You would have seen this. Like this, no, bivalve. Lines like this. This oyster is known to eat only by filtering water. And whatever filtered it eats. So oyster is an example of filter feeder. Another good example we can say whales. Whales is another example for filter feeders. But here for this question, the answer is C. In case of which one of the following biogeochemical cycles, the weathering of rocks is a main source of release of nutrients to enter. So one of the simplest questions. These are the questions that will give you easy marks. Never ever make a wrong. You should have known carbon and nitrogen cycle. They are gaseous cycles. But phosphorus and sulfur cycle are the only sedimentary cycles. But even in this, sulfur cycle has gaseous components like sulfur dioxide, H2S, they are there. The only one where there are no gas is phosphorus cycle. So phosphorus cycle has no gaseous phase. So the main source of that should be weathering, erosion. That could be the only source. The correct answer is phosphorus cycle. So 77th question C is the right answer. 78th question, which of the following are detrivores? Detrivores means that which eats the dead animal, dead organic matter. Earthworm, we would have known earthworm as a yeah, detrivore, correct? So wherever one comes, it comes in A, it comes in C, it comes in D, good. Now next, the jellyfish. You would have heard about jellyfish and also the venom it has, you know, it can sting. It can sting, capture fishes and takes them up and swallows it. How it can be detrivo? It eats live fishes. It cannot be. So wherever two comes, you see, two comes here, wrong. Two comes here, wrong. Two comes here, wrong. The correct answer is C, simple. The correct answer, in fact, is 1, 3, and 5. 1, earthworm, millipede, wood lice. They are called as detrivores, which feeds on dead organic matter. The common carbon metric, it is not a very, uh, very well known or well, well established uh, idea. So not many of you would have known about this. So but carbon, common carbon metric is in fact is an assessment of the carbon footprint in the operation of buildings. So the correct answer for 79th is A, which is maintained by UNEP. So I know it, it would be a very uh, vague question. Unless you know this, you should not have touched this question. You should have leave this. Which of the following have species that can establish symbiotic relationship with other organisms? Once again, this question is tricky because whenever we say symbiotic relationship, please pay attention. Um, uh, in ecology, you would have studied about mutualism, uh, common cellism, amen cellism. That is what called as relationship between one organism and the other. But you know what is symbiosis? Any relationship, even if one animal eats another animal, if one other animal sacrifices itself, whatever it is, any relationship between two organisms is called a symbiosis. And we also know every organism always depends on another organism, including plants. They cannot live on their own. They always need the help of other organisms. So Abhipatona, everyone is in symbiotic. So with this understanding, we can simply say symbiotic means it has to come all the three. 
Simple. If you simply go with what you understand from the word symbiosis, okay. Let us go more clearly, then we know that cnidarians, fungi and protozoa. For example, protozoa are known to live symbiotically with termites. And nidarians are also associated with many marine organisms. Fungi is known to live in association with plants. And also lichens, you would have read about lichens. <coughs> so 80th question, all the 1, 2, and 3. Either you know specifically the answer is 1, 2, and 3, or if you go by what the word symbiosis stands for, then also the answer is same D. So question number 80, the answer is D. Eight is sixth question. R2 code of practices. So R2 actually means R and R, which stands for recycling and refurbishing. So rather than buying an article and discarding them, resulting in uh, uh, increase in landfills and pollution, rather than that, uh, the products that are to be discarded can be can we recycle that? Can we refurbish it? And this refurbishing, recycling, you, you know, to which field it is very uh, strongly associated with electronics recycling industry. The R2 code of standards is in fact is associated with environmentally responsible practices in electronics recycling industry, but it actually stands for recycling and refurbishing. The 86th question, A is the right answer. Why is there a concern about copper smelting plants? Yeah, probably there is a lot of concern. Even in Tirunelveli, the Vedanta uh, operations, uh, it is in fact also a copper smelting plant. They may release lethal quantities of carbon monoxide into environment. No. It releases carbon monoxide, true. You know what is lethal? Lethal means which can cause death. So release of carbon monoxide is a different statement. Lethal dose of carbon monoxide, that's a different statement. So one is wrong. But other than that, copper slag can cause the copper slag means what uh, when the cop when the copper smelting is done, they will mix the copper ore with the sulfite ores and other relevant uh, and, and, and also other uh, subsequent catalysts. When they are when they heat it to a very high temperature, there is a certain kind of a dust, dirt-like things. You know, if it's a red hot mineral getting melted, some kind of a dirt like a black thing can settle on top of it, will be floating. That actually called as copper slag. That copper slag is a waste. And that waste, in fact, is a source of heavy metals, correct. A heavy metals like arsenic, cadmium, chromium, it is a source of heavy metals, correct. So second is a correct statement. In fact, one point I want to tell you, if you already chosen one is a wrong, statement then already you got the right answer the correct answer is two and three it doesn't need further deliberation so you must be crucial in in choosing whether that particular statement is right or not so here two and three b is the right answer <coughs> and question number 88 with the reference to furnace oil Furnace oil is a dark, black colored, thick, viscous oil, very viscous oil uh, that is known to contain 32,000 ppm of sulfur per liter. It comes in use many times because furnace oil been re recently been largely used because of its cheap, because of its low cost, because of its low cost. Certain local manufacturers like uh, cement factories, um, uh, uh, brick kilns where they make brick, they need something to burn, right? There they started using furnace oil, even in some generators because of its low cost. They can't buy diesel. And the problem is it is a very, very, very potent release of sulfur emissions. So that has been very much used. Uh, very much been discussed in uh, news in the recent three four years it has been discussed a lot so furnace oil it is a product of oil refineries correct some industries use it to generate power yes 
it use causes sulfur emissions into the environment yes so 88 all the statements 1 2 and 3 is correct we are coming to the last question of today's session i think in the nature which of the following is are most likely to be found surviving on a surface without soil surviving on a surface without soil this also is a very tricky question but easy i won't say it's difficult it's easy if you think properly first let's see fern lichen moss mushroom what are the two things that you very well know you would have known about mushroom you would have known about lichen right let's think let's start the thinking from there lichens you would have seen that lichens are known to grow on top of other trees it, it tends to grow on roofs. It doesn't need soil. It doesn't need, it's surviving on a surface without soil. Lichen comes first. You, you have to remember seeing the pictures in, in NCRTs and all. Lichens just grows like a patches. So, lichens has to be the correct answer. Uh, one thing that you should be clear. Lichens. Okay. So where two comes, it comes B and C, that's it. Now you need to know about three, whether three is or not, whether three grows or not. But if you actually see fern, moss and mushroom, including mushroom, they all need soil, a substratum for the better growth of its roots. Without the roots to get uh, support from the soil, it cannot grow. So the correct answer is lichen. And one more thing, I want to say another point also. Sir, what about aquaculture, sir? What about aquaponics, sir? You would have thought about that. But, but see, see the question clearly. In the nature, aquaponics is not nature. In the nature, what is grown without any uh, supportive soil structure? It's only lichens. So correct answer for this question is B, two only. So with this, I'll, I'll, I'll take time and I, I would like to say congratulate uh, for those who have taken this prelims examination and don't worry about the results, okay? Now, always everything should be done uh, based on the time. Like a farmer, okay, who don't wait whether sun comes tomorrow or not. They always do the preparation what is required. And this paper, I'll say, if you use the logic, some 10, 15 questions from 33 questions, what I've discussed can be easily tackled. 10, 15 can, could have been easily tackled. Never mind, never mind. I will say generally it's a little tough paper. There's been a lot of traps and loopholes kept in the question that if you were not attentive, it might be a little difficult to get the correct answer. But what I will say is, now take a, take a day or two off, uh, cool yourself and straight away jump into mains preparation because that is what a serious aspirant will do. So with this, uh, it's great. Uh, thank you for giving this opportunity in this very heightened time uh, after giving the prelims examination to watch the key. Thank you everyone. Please stay tuned. We have other faculties also coming back to discuss the rest of the questions. All the best and take care. Bye.